We begin by praising Allah, we praise Him, we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. And we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. Now, let me introduce myself, my background. Um, I was born in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam. My father at the time was a colonial administrator in the now uh, defunct British Empire. Um, an empire that stretched once upon a time, wasn't that long ago, uh, over one third of the Earth's surface. Now the only thing left is uh, some islands in the Falklands. That's all that's left of it. How things change. How the mighty have fallen. This is a lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to in the Quran. To travel the earth and see the consequence. See what happened to people who came before you. Who were mightier in power and strength and see what is left of them. So anyway, my father, a colonial administrator, that's where I was born in Tanzania, and they named me Anthony Vatswaf Gavin Green. Okay, I thought you were going to laugh. Vatswaf, Vatswaf is a Polish name, because my mother, in fact, is Polish. And being Polish, she is um, a Roman Catholic. And she always intended that me and my brother, Duncan, Duncan Charles Alexander Green, would be raised up good Catholics and so uh, almost from the day that we were born we were enrolled in what is a very famous Roman Catholic boarding school. In fact it's a monastic boarding school that means it's also a monastery, a place where monks live and teach. And this place is called, this school is called Ampleforth College. It's in Yorkshire, which is in the north of England. So, um, when I was two years old, we left uh, Dar es Salaam. Uh, my brother was born in London. And uh, when we were, well, when he was like eight and I was like ten, we were sent off to boarding school. So from the age of ten, I was sent to uh, this, the preparatory school of Ampleforth College. Now, before... Before my mum, before they sent us off to Ampleforth College, I think my mum decided it was about time that she uh, taught me um, some of the prayers of the Catholics and some of the things that they say. She better prepare me a little bit for this uh, life in the monastery. And although she had married my father, who was an agnostic, which was not really allowed, she was only supposed to marry a Catholic, but she went ahead and married my dad anyway. And uh, she always considered herself as a sort of, not a very good Catholic, but she was going to make up for it by sending me and my brother to the school. And I remember one night she taught me a prayer, a prayer that is used by Catholics quite often. It's one of the frequently used prayers when, when they have a rosary, which is a string of beads on which they count a series of prayers. The main prayer that is said is called the Hail Mary. And it goes like this, it begins like this. Hail Mary, Mother of God, blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Now, it was the first bit that when I was a nine-year-old child, hearing my mother say, Hail Mary, Mother of God, I said to myself, how can God have a mother? God is supposed to be without beginning and without end. How could God have a mummy? And so I sat there thinking about this mother of God and I decided to myself that, well, if Mary was the mother of God, she must actually be a bigger God 
than God. Those were the first questions that arose in my mind. And as I went to school, and as I began to think more and study more and research more, I in fact had more and more questions. We used to have to go to confession. Now confession, um, I, I think as far as I remember, we had to do it a minimum of, I think it was once a year, it might have been more than that, uh, but at, you know, at least there was a certain amount of times, you, a minimum you had to do it. And the priest used to say, you have to confess all your sins. If you didn't confess all of them, then confession is no good and none of your sins will be forgiven. Now believe me, can you imagine? A school of boys aged what? 11, 10, all the way up to 19, 20. You think we're going to be confessing all our sins? And moreover, confessing our sins to the very people who are our housemasters. In other words, they're in charge of us. Now I soon figure that this must be some huge spy conspiracy in order to keep control of people by going and confessing your sins. And I just, and I, and then I used to ask them why. Please tell me, why do I have to go to you to confess my sins to you? Why can't I just ask God to forgive me? I mean, after all, after all, according to Jesus, according to the Bible, we would say, the, the actual scriptures, Jesus is supposed to have said, the only prayer that you need is our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Right? That is the prayer. As for the other bit, they add sometimes in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, and the power and the glory. That's not there. They added that. If you actually look in the gospel, that's the Our Father. Now, in the Our Father, you are asking God to forgive you your trespasses, your sins. So, how come I have to come and ask some priest? And you know what they said? They said to me, well, you can ask God if you want to, but you can't be sure that God's going to listen to you. <laughs> right? So, I had a real problem. You know, I had a real problem with this. And I had real problems with the doctrines of the church. I think one of the things that I also had a problem with, a very, very big problem, is the doctrine of incarnation. The idea that God became a man. Now, just to mention something about this. When I was... <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. When I was, uh, how old? 11 years old, my dad uh, took a job in Egypt. He became the uh, general manager of Cairo Barclays. He opened up Barclays Bank in Cairo. And that's for the next 10 years of my life. That's where I spent my holidays. So I'd be going to school in England and to Egypt for my holidays. Now, you see... Western society indoctrinates us with an equation. The equation tells us wealth equals happiness. Wealth equals happiness. If you want to be happy, if you want to enjoy your life, you need money. Because when you have money, you can buy our nice cars and have our nice TV sets and watch those movies and go on holiday and buy all these things that you so desperately need to fill your lives with, to make your lives happy. This is, what the pro this is what they're telling us the whole time. Yet, in reality, that's not the case at all. And you see, my eyes were being opened up to this. And I began to ask myself as I went back to school, and I have to say I really did not like school at all. I particularly didn't like boarding school. I just couldn't understand why I was in this monastery on the edge of the Yorkshire Moors 
miles and miles away from anything and anybody. And here I was in this place. Why? What was it all for? I began to ask myself. You know, I used to love my life in Egypt. And I come back to England and I, I just, why? Why? I would ask myself. And then this is where I began to ask this question. What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? For what reason do we exist? What do all these things mean? What does it mean, love? What is life for? What is it all about? And I figured it. I sat down and I figured it. And I said, yep, I am here at school in order to work hard so that I will get good results in my exams. So I can go to a good university, so I can get a good degree, so I can get a good job that will make me enough money so that when I get married and have kids, I can send them back to that same expensive public school, private school, and that they can work hard and get a good degree so that they can get a good job so that when they have kids, they can earn enough money to send their kids back to that school, right? And, and, and then I thought about it, I thought, that's it. That's the purpose of life. That's what it's all for. I said, no way. I can't believe that's all there is to life. And so I began a quest. It was not like today I'm going on a quest for the truth. It wasn't like that. It was just I began to think. I began to search. I began to look through other religions. You know, anything that I thought might give me an insight and an understanding to what is the purpose of life? What is it all about? Now, when I was about 19, something happened very, very, something very important happened. And that was in the 10 years that I spent and my holidays in Egypt, only one person ever really had a decent conversation with me about Islam. Now, I had many, many questions about Catholicism, but when it came to anyone challenging me, okay, or questioning me, I would vigorously defend. I would become a defender of the faith. <laughs> you know, even though I didn't actually believe in it, but, you know, I suddenly became a defender of it. It was a strange paradox, okay? I had many questions in my mind, but, you know, especially when it's this Egyptian. I mean, after all, what does he know? <laughs> I'm English. We used to rule these chaps not a few years ago. You know, after this conversation has been going on for about 40 minutes, he's, he asks me a few simple questions, and they've stuck in my head until this day. He said, so you believe that Jesus is God? I said, yes. And he said, and you believe Jesus died on the cross? I said, yes. He said, so you believe God died? And when he said that, you know what? It was, if Mike Tyson had come and smacked me in the face with a fist, right? It wouldn't have had, I mean, I was absolutely flabbergasted. Because I suddenly realized the irrationality and the, 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 the just, I have to say it, the foolishness of that, of what I was believing. And I, inside myself, I said, of course I don't believe that God died. You can't kill God. And I realized that all these years I had been taught something. I had been indoctrinated with something. I had been taught this thing and I always felt uncomfortable with it. But you know, it just took someone to spell it out for me in clear, simple terms. Look, if you believe this and you believe this, then you must believe that. And I realized that, no, I didn't believe that. But you know what? I wasn't going to admit that to him. I wasn't going to admit. I said, 
That's been very interesting, and I, I've got to go up to my cabin now, okay? <laughs> Bye! <laughs> you know, I didn't want to think about it, and I went up and started smoking and having a coffee and writing and doing anything to think about except what the guy had been telling me. But, you know, it had its effect. It really had its effect. You know, because after that stage, and this is something, like I said, I'd always been uncomfortable with. But that was a big changing point in my life. You could say it was an epiphany. No one, if you're on a spiritual journey, a quest for truth, you wouldn't have thought of dreamed of looking at Islam. And I didn't. I looked at everything. So I reached this stage when I basically, I was, I was basically at this stage a hippie. Okay? So I was about now 20 years old, 19, 20 years old. I was a hippie. I had, by this stage, invented my own religion. Okay? This religion was bits and pieces of all the religions that I had studied and I took them all together and I made my own religion. Okay? And so therefore I started to develop this philosophy of my own religion but it didn't take me long to figure that this was the worst bunch of rubbish that I'd ever come across. Right? I mean, of all the things I'd been through, it was the worst. And I said to myself, forget it. Forget religion, forget spirituality, forget all this stuff. Maybe there's no meaning to life. Maybe there's just nothing more to life than being rich. Maybe my problem was, is that I didn't have enough money. Now to show you what I'm thinking of in terms of the money I thought I would need to make me happy, I'm thinking here, yachts and private jets. That's the stage that I'm going to need to move up to, right? So you can imagine my lifestyle before that, okay? So I'm thinking to myself, money, okay, let's go back to money. How do I make lots of money with very little effort? Because who wants to work hard? Who wants to spend all the time working? You want money and then you want to enjoy that money. So less work, more money, that's what we need. Maximum enjoyment. So I thought to myself, let's make a study of this. Let's start thinking about people who have got money in the world. Okay, and let's think about how they got their money. So I started thinking. I started thinking about Britain. Okay, lots of money there. No problem. But too much work. What, the Industrial Revolution? Oh, no way, you know. All those satanic mills and those dark mills and all that industrial, no, forget that. America, you know, the American dream. What is the American dream? You're in the gutter and you struggle. And it's the rat race and you make it and you're the self-made Millionaire said, that is definitely too much hard work. The Japanese, they've got lots of money, but all they do is work. That's all they ever do. And in those days, they were well known, the Japanese, for being workaholics. And then it came to me. Those Saudi Arabians. They've been sitting on their camels, <laughs> going, Allahu Akbar. And they've got all this money. That's the one. That's it. Let me look at that. That's interesting. No effort, maximum money. There's got to be something there. So I said to myself, okay, let me think about it. Of course. Okay, what's their religion, their book? Yeah, the Quran. Right, let me have a look at this Quran. There's got to be something interesting there. And that, that is really what motivated me to go down to the bookshop. And I took a translation of the Quran. And you know what, I really believe it had to be like that way because I was really just approaching the Qur'an out of curiosity to see what it had to say. I was coming with an open mind, you know. I was not looking for truths, I was not looking for what, I was just curious to see what did this book have to say. Was there something there? That's all. Otherwise, I don't think I ever would have looked at it, okay. So I took it down and uh, began reading the Qur'an. Now, I'm a pretty fast reader. And I remember very clearly, I was in a train, I was going from where I was living, across the River Thames, okay, to Victoria train station. I remember very distinctly, I was sitting in the train, reading, I was sitting next to the window, reading this translation of the Qur'an. I looked out of the window, I looked back and I said to myself, if I have ever read a book that is from God, this is it. And that 
really, I could say, was the moment that I realized and I believed that the Qur'an was from God. And uh, it was always my habit. You know, I didn't just read about things, I tried to practice them. You know, you can read and read and read, but you know, like they say, you can look at the orange all day long. It looks nice, it's pretty, it's orange, it smells nice, but you know, how does it taste? You have to taste it, right? Okay, so that was it. So I, I used to go home and I used to try and pray. I didn't really know how to pray. I remember seeing our cook in Egypt. I used to remember seeing him pray. So I sort of try to remember what he used to do. I remember it used to really impress me, this simple man and the beautiful way he used to pray and comparing it with the rituals in the Catholic Church. And I was always impressed by it. So there I was trying to imitate it. And this went on for a while. And then uh, one day I found myself in a bookshop that was part of a mosque. Okay? So I found myself in this bookshop. And all these books and Muhammad and Salah and prayer. And then I was looking at all this and... Wow, fantastic, look at all of this stuff. And a guy comes and he says to me, excuse me, uh, are you a Muslim? And I'm thinking, well, I am Muslim. What, is it? what does he mean by that? He said, listen, I said to him, I'll tell you, I believe there is only one God, which is Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. He said, you're a Muslim. I said, oh, thanks. <laughs> it's, it's not, yeah, oh, good. He said, Lord, we're just about to pray. Do you want to you come and pray? Now, it must have been Jummah. It must have been Jummah because you never see a mosque at midday. I, I mean, I didn't know about Jummah then, okay? But I went and I prayed and everyone was like, and I was sort of like, oh, what's going on? And I was, I've obviously got it wrong all this time, you know? And, you know, but I remember afterwards, you know, everyone was surrounding me, you know? And everyone there wanted to teach me the whole of Islam in five minutes. You know, I, I remember walking out of that, feeling literally like I had been given a shower on the inside and like I was walking on clouds. It was quite fantastic. Now, actually, I would say that that's about two-thirds of my story. The, the other third, okay, we don't have time to go into it, maybe another time, okay? But very briefly, I would have to say that in spite of that being the time when I entered into Islam, it really took me another two years before I was really able to start practicing properly and you know it was really actually very hard to give up my former way of life you know and the things that I used to do but I, I you know Allah taught me some pretty hard lessons I don't regret them they're very you know I look back now and I learned some very good lessons from those days but you know they were the two most miserable years of my life why because I knew the truth and I wasn't following it actually that's the worst condition a human being can ever be in. You know, because if you're ignorant, you know they say ignorance is bliss. Actually, ignorance itself isn't bliss. But meaning when you don't know something, you're in a sort of state of innocence. But when you know something, and then you don't live according to what you know, you can't live with yourself. It's terrible. It's a horrible condition. And, and that's what happened to me for about two years. But alhamdulillah, you know, alhamdulillah, I came back to Islam, I came back to the deen. I never, I never used to say, I mean, I would always say that I'm Muslim. You know, I would always say that I was Muslim. I, people just didn't take me seriously. You know, there I was at parties and drinking wine. And, you know, I remember sometimes I was sitting at a party and sitting around people, telling people about Islam. And they'd be going, yeah, really, that's fantastic. Tell me more. And I said, oh, I'm just too gone. I'm just too... Uh, you know, I've been drinking too much. Oh, I can't. And, no, tell us oh, 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 a blunk like that. That's my condition that I was in. But you know, alhamdulillah, Allah woke me out of that. And um, you know, then it happened. I, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa taala guided me, and I, you know, came back round. And the really the thing that changed me, brothers and sisters, was this. Really, a simple thing, a very simple thing. I started to pray five times a day. You know, people say to me, Abdul Rahim, what? You know, how can I? You know what? The prayer, if you do the prayer properly, if you really pray five, and I, that's what I said, I, I promised Allah that I will pray five times a day. I said, I don't know that if I can do anything else, but I will do that. And I took it really seriously. You know, I took it really, really, really seriously. Alhamdulillah, the prayer when it is said properly is something that itself will change your life. Now, I know you're going to ask me another question. I know there's two questions you will ask me. So I'll answer them before you ask me. All right? Number one is, how does it feel to be a Muslim? 
and compared to how it was before. Now, I will tell you honestly how it is like. If I was to describe it, it would be like this. Imagine you live or imagine you find yourself in a building. And this building, like any building, is full of obstacles, chairs, tables, lamps, stairs. Imagine just even this room. If we made it pitch black, I mean so dark that you could not see a thing. Right? And we left you here and then we started mixing you all around and everyone had to think. Now imagine you try and find your way out. Imagine I try and find my way out. I'm going to bang myself, hit myself, fall over. You know, you're living in this dark place. This is like disbelief. This is like the state where you are out of Islam. You're in this dark place. You don't really know where you're going. You don't know where you've come from. And life is full of obstacles. It keeps throwing things at you. And you've got real no, you don't really know how to cope with them. Islam, it is really like you open the door and then you stepped outside and you're in the light. Suddenly you could see, suddenly you could understand, suddenly everything is clear. This is what it is like. Or you could also say it is like the difference between death and life, between being really alive and being dead. Because this is Islam. It brings the light and the peace and the tranquility to the hearts. It is a, a beautiful, beautiful thing, you know. So this is how we could say how I could really compare um, Islam. And I know the other question is going to be, what did your parents say? And I have to say honestly that me and my parents, alhamdulillah, have a better relationship now that I'm Muslim than we ever had before. I mean, if you really were able to get them to be honest, right, and to tell them how they really feel, they would admit without a shadow of a doubt, okay, that Islam has given me responsibility, it has ordered me to treat them with so much respect, and they would have to admit that, that Islam has been something that's good for me and also good for my relationship between me and them. So, you know, we get on, alhamdulillah, now really, really well, alhamdulillah. Okay, brothers and sisters, I hope I've covered most of the how do I come to Islam questions, okay?